Hello again. For the next two lectures, we are going to talk about preventing and resolving virus infections using means that we devise. And today we'll talk about vaccines. Next time we'll talk about antiviral drugs. And vaccines are part of science that makes our lives great. It has resulted in an increase in our lifespan starting from 1900 to the present, a huge increase. If you were alive in 1900, born in 1900, you would expect to live about 50 years. If you go back even further, you are lucky to get out of your 30s. And this is because of medicines, including vaccines, antimicrobials, public health measures, all developed by science. Vaccination, of course, uses our immune response to do this, and memory, of course, is a key component of it. And as we will see, making people immune breaks the chain of transmission. So a virus cannot find a new host, and that is the end of an outbreak. We talked about immune memory before and protective immune responses. We showed this slide, but I'll show it again. If we look at the production of antibody or cells, T cells, after the first infection, there is a lag of a few weeks before we get an immune response. We then have protective immunity as a result of memory, which we talked about before. And then if you then encounter the pathogen again later on, can be years later, it depends on the particular pathogen, you have a very rapid memory response, which will then prevent you from being reinfected. And this is what we tap into in vaccines. The first vaccine is credited to Edward Jenner in 1796, although in China they had been practicing the art of scarification using smallpox. Smallpox has been a scourge of humans for many, many hundreds of years. And as I said in the very first day, people realized that individuals who got smallpox never got it again. So there was this practice of scarification where you would take a pustule, inoculate it into someone else. Now, unfortunately, they had a 30% chance of dying from that, but 70% chance of living and being immune. Edward Jenner took this one step further. He noticed that milkmaids who got cowpox on their hands never got smallpox. So he took a cowpox pustule and inoculated a young man in 1796 with a ground up pustule. And then he waited two weeks, which was very good experimental design. Then he challenged the boy with smallpox. And of course, at this time, we don't know anything about viruses. All we know is that there are some agents that make you sick and some people recover and they never get sick again. So he thought, well, maybe this cowpox helps. And in fact, the boy was protected and that started vaccination. Later on, Pasteur, who developed the rabies vaccine, called it vaccination because the Latin vaca for cow, and then yellow fever and influenza vaccines in the 1930s. Not rapid progress. Of course, we didn't know what a virus was until uh, the late 1800s. Recently, it's been decided that it probably wasn't cowpox virus that Jenner used. It was probably horsepox virus that just happens to infect cows. He also used horsepox virus uh, in some of his experiments. Anyway, that's the first vaccination. And nowadays, the people who get immunized against smallpox, the military and other people at risk for bioterrorism, you use this bifurcated needle, you put a drop of smallpox vaccine into it, you scrape it into the outer layers of skin, and it replicates and causes a pustule. I still have my smallpox scar from when I was a kid here. Uh, none of you probably do, because unless you work in, in the army or bioterrorism research, because we don't immunize any longer because the virus has been eradicated. As I said before, though, this practice of scarification not only puts the virus into the right cells, but it also initiates inflammation, and it makes the vaccine work better. It's been shown in animal experiments. If you simply inoculate the vaccine with a needle, you don't get the same immune response because you don't get inflammation. That was the first vaccine, and of course, immediately the anti-vaxxers came out, and here's a woodcut from the, the era of Jenner entitled The Cowpox or The Wonderful Effects of the New Inoculation. Uh, the idea was that if you got this Jenner inoculation, you would grow cow parts at the site of inoculation. Just as logical as the anti-vaxxers are today. 
Large-scale vaccination efforts have been done with many viruses, including smallpox and poliovirus and others. They can make a difference. They are successful. We'll talk more about some of these today. Polio, two vaccines have almost eliminated poliovirus globally. It was once uh, infecting many thousands of people just in the U.S. alone. The same with measles virus, which caused many cases uh, in the 60s and before the vaccine introduction in the 60s has not eliminated it because people refuse to give this vaccine to their kids. Some people in this country because they think it causes autism, but it does not. Here on the right is a graph showing you deaths by measles that have been prevented by vaccination. So we have the purple line, estimated measles deaths in the absence of vaccination. Uh, this is from 2000 to 2012. This is in millions. These are millions of deaths prevented by vaccination. The red line is the deaths with vaccination, far fewer, of course, and the bars in between are the number of prevented illnesses. Vaccines work. They can wipe out uh, infections. They can stop outbreaks, and they prevent death as well. We now use them routinely in our medical care. They are part of our existence. We immunize not only children, but we uh, immunize adults as well. There are vaccines specifically for older people like shingles vaccines and influenza vaccines. We immunize our livestock, pigs. We even immunize fish. Can you imagine immunizing individual fish on fish farms? We immunize chickens. We also immunize wild animals that carry rabies. We drop into the forest from a helicopter rabies vaccine laced meat into the forest and the wild animals eat that and become immune. So childhood diseases are now rare. When I was a kid, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, etc., everybody got them. You knew when someone was out of school, they had one of those. It's no longer a problem. And maybe that's part of the issue with anti-vaxxers is that they say, oh, there's no more infectious diseases left, so I don't need to immunize my kids. They're part of our first world public health measures, but third world still lags behind because they don't have the money to pay for it. My philosophy is we should pay for it, but no one listens to me. Instead of spending money to kill people, why don't we spend money on vaccines and give them away? What a novel concept. An important idea about how vaccines work is herd immunity. This is all about population scale immunity. You immunize enough people, and you will block transmission because there won't be enough people to transmit the virus. And that's illustrated on this diagram at the bottom here. So on the left, we have an infected individual in red. Around that individual are susceptibles. They're all susceptible. None of them are immune, so they can all be infected by the individual. Now in the second figure, we have some green individuals who have been vaccinated or even infected at a previous time, they're now immune. So this red infected person will not infect them. And consequently, anyone who is still susceptible is indirectly protected because there simply aren't enough people to form a chain uh, of infection. Of course, if everyone were immunized, there would be no spread, but that's a rare situation in a population. Mostly you have a certain fraction of the population that is immune. And that's the key here. The transmission stops when a certain fraction of the population is immune because the virus can't transmit. And that threshold is virus and population specific. Why would it be? Well, virus specific because the R naught, the number of infections that can go from an infected individual to others varies for each virus. That will influence the, the threshold of herd immunity. Different populations have different thresholds for developing immunity due to genetics. So the threshold of herd immunity is different. Here are some examples to give you a sense. For smallpox, you need 80 to 85% of the population to be immune to stop transmission. So you see 20 to 15% can be non-immune. They can be susceptible, but because most of the other people are immune, they won't be infected. For measles, the number is higher. And that's part of the issue with measles. If you have a few percent of the population who are not immunizing their kids, you have outbreaks as a consequence. Compounding the issue here is that no vaccine is 100% effective. If I immunize 100 people, you will never have 100 people becoming protected against infection. 
It has to do with the genetics of the population. Not everyone responds equally. So for example, uh, if you take a population and immunize them with measles vaccine, 80% of the population, you only get 76% immune to infection. So if you need 93 to 95% to stop measles transmission, you have to go even higher. And that's hard. It's hard to get a lot, everybody immunized. There are very few countries that can do that. We're not one of them. You know, you're, you're lucky if you can get in the 90s with most vaccines in terms of uptake. Other countries do better than we do. Complacency is a big issue. I complain about this all the time. But these are some of the things people say to justify not getting a vaccine. And it's an uphill battle to convince people that they need to immunize. I'm in favor of telling people why a vaccine will protect you. What are the downsides of being infected, say with measles, one in a thousand people getting encephalitis or dying? I think you, as a physician, you should educate your patient. You shouldn't just say, you need to take this. That doesn't help, I think. But you have to make it compelling so that they don't come up with, uh, you know, I don't have time. I'm not injecting anything into my body. Our president has gone on record saying this. Of course, he's a liar because he got all the vaccines he needs. He just says what his constituency wants to hear, which includes anti-vaxxers. I met someone recently, a physician, and she told me, I'm glad Trump is president because at least he's not for vaccination. And I said, that's, that's impossible. She said, well, I believe in giving patients a choice. And I said, well, you can't do that because herd immunity doesn't work that way. And she said, herd immunity has not been proven to work. Of course it has. It's been proven over and over. I don't know where she went to medical school. But if you go to medical school, I know a lot of you are going to go. And if they tell you herd immunity hasn't been proven to work, let me know. Okay, I want to talk to them. Because you shouldn't be trained that way. You should go out there and convince your patients that this is important. Give them good reasons. Public acceptance is really important. These are some outbreaks in the US where a community has been told that vaccines are not good for them, and they believe it. Look at this here, 58 cases of measles uh, involving an Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn. 23 cases of measles in a Hare Krishna community in North Carolina. Here in Texas, a pastor was critical of measles vaccination. I say stick to religion. Don't talk about vaccines because you don't know anything about it. How, well, why would this pastor know anything about measles? Anyway, his, his congregation listened to him, and there was a measles outbreak. So there are lots of outbreaks here in other parts of the countries, too, uh, where there are measles. Some of them are tied to religious communities and some not. I've seen signs in my town meeting tonight on why you shouldn't vaccinate your kids. And they all get together, and a bunch of them start talking to each other. Then you have this group think they decide not to immunize their kids. So that's a real issue. So we have to work against this. And my feeling is we use the facts. It's an uphill battle. One of the things you can do is give a personal experience. Tell it how it, it worked for you. I read a book by Paul Offit. Paul Offit is a um, pediatrician at Penn who developed a rotavirus vaccine. And he says in the beginning, his wife is a physician. She had a baby on her lap, was going to give it a vaccine. The mother was sitting right there. A minute before she injected the baby, the baby had a seizure on the doctor's lap. Do you think if she had given the baby the injection and the baby had the seizure, that the mother would believe it had nothing to do with the vaccine? No. So this is the problem we face. Things happen in life, and we immunize so many people that they seem to happen after the vaccine. Herd immunity demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock, emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population, emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population, describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices or all of the above, which is right. Herd immunity, I'm glad you didn't say livestock, okay, emphasizes that everyone must be immune, not everyone must be immune to, prevent, to protect the population. So B is correct, 50% of you got that, but 30% of you said, Everyone must be immune to protect the population, but that's not it, right? Not everyone has to be immune. And how could it be all of the above if you have everyone and not everyone? How could you pick all of the above? Anyway, so that's the answer. It is B. Now, the two kinds of vaccines, 
We're going to spend most of the time talking about active vaccines, but there's also something called passive vaccine. An active vaccine, we, we give the individual a modified form of the pathogen to, to induce immunity. This gives you, in theory, long time protection, which is what we want. Passive, we put products of the immune response. We put antibodies, usually. That's what we do now. In theory, you could add immune cells, but we haven't figured out how to do that. And that just gives you short-term protection because the antibodies have a short half-life. Even though you can engineer them to last a bit longer with various interesting modifications, you're not going to get more than a few months protection. So here is a common passive vaccine here in this bottle, rabies immune globulin. They take people, they give them rabies vaccine, and then they take serum from them, and they purify the IgG to make sure there's nothing else in the serum as well, and this is sold. And so if you get bitten by a rabid animal, or an animal that may be rabid, you know, you don't always know, but if, if you're in the woods and a raccoon comes running up to you and bites your leg, it's probably rabid, because they don't usually do that. So then you should go to a, uh, an emergency room and tell them they will give you this, they will inject it at the bite site to try and neutralize virus, and then they will immunize you at the same time because you have about two weeks before the virus goes from your leg into your brain and kills you. Now, if you're bitten on the face, you don't have two weeks because the virus can get there quicker. So stay away from raccoons. Don't get close to them so they don't bite your face. This is a natural passive vaccine, of course. It's what you get from your mom. Your mother transfers through the placenta, her IgG, so that at birth you have a nice bit of, uh, of antibody. Maternally transferred IgG in red, so it, it's that level at birth. This, it goes down slowly, so this one is about six months duration, so that the half-life there is accounting for that. And of course the baby then makes its own complement. But here the baby will get the mother's complement of infections. Whatever she has had in her life, she will pass on to the child. And so this is a form of a passive vaccine. ZMAP is one that was used for Ebola virus during the West African outbreak a number of years ago. Here's Ebola virus, the filamentous virus with glycoproteins on the surface of the envelope. Virus-like particles were produced that are not infectious, so they're not, you don't need to work with them in BSL-4. Mice are immunized with the virus-like particle. They isolate monoclonal antibodies that block infection, and then they're chimerized into a human IgG scaffold. In other words, they change all, all the amino acids in the mouse monoclonal to be human, except, of course, the combining site. Can't change that, but the rest they change so that it won't, you won't make an antibody response against the antibody. And then they make the antibodies in tobacco plants, because it's very cheap to do that. And so this was an experimental vaccine at the time of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It was actually used in a few people. Not at all clear if it worked at all, because there were no controls in very few cases. But now many other companies have made similar products, and if there is another outbreak, they can be used. Here's another great example I like to talk about, which was in this book. It's described in this book, Fever, which I told you about before. It's a description of the emergence of Lassa virus in Nigeria in the 60s. This, this nurse, Penny Pinio, she was working in Nigeria. She got sick. A nurse had already died of Lassa. This was a brand new infection. Nobody knew about it before. So they airlifted her to Columbia Medical Center and they put her on a Boeing 707 with everybody else. No protection whatsoever. Amazing that no one got infected. She came here, she recovered just because that was what was gonna to happen to her. They didn't do anything that really helped her to recover except supportive therapy. But they took some of her serum and sent her home. And then Jordi Casals was working with the virus at Yale. He infected himself, probably mouth pipetted because that's what we used to do back then. And he lived in northern Manhattan, so they brought him into Columbia Presbyterian, and they said, let's give him Penny Pinio serum. And they did passive therapy, and he, he lived, so that saved his life. Great example of use of a passive therapy. Now let's talk about active vaccines for the rest of the time today. And here are some of the requirements. First of all, it has to make the right immune response. And what I mean by that is Th1 versus Th2. So you need to know what the virus does. We call this the correlates of protection. What is it that protects people who are infected? Is it antibody or 
Is it cellular immunity? Sometimes we don't know. For poliovirus, people figured this out a long time ago, and therefore they made a vaccine that induced antibody. Today, we do not know the correlates of protection for HIV. That's why every vaccine trial for HIV fails, because we don't know what to induce, and whatever it is that we're inducing doesn't work. So you need to know if it's Th1 or Th2. You also have to protect the person against disease. You can't just immunize people and measure their antibodies and say they made neutralizing antibodies against this vaccine. It's not good enough. You have to do a clinical trial to see if they're protected. And that means you have to send them out in the world to get infected. And that's hard to do. Well, why is it hard? Well, for some viruses, there's no outbreaks. Right now, there's no Ebola. There's no very little Zika, so we can't test any of those vaccines. There's plenty of HIV, but if you're going to do an HIV vaccine trial, you have to counsel the participants and tell them not to engage in risky behavior, i.e. unprotected sex. You have to tell them that. But in fact, that's what you want them to do. Otherwise, you can't test your vaccine. And in fact, a certain number out of 100 people won't listen to you, and that's what makes your trial work. It's a sad fact, but that's how it goes. And you get very small numbers. Getting a response is not enough. You have to actually show that the vaccine protects. A couple of other requirements. Of course, the vaccine has to be safe. It can't make you sick like the virus infection does. It has to work in a population, not just individuals. You have to have long-lasting protection. This is a big problem with the current flu vaccine. The protection is not long-lasting at all. And you know we do tell people to get it because it will protect you, but you have to get it every year, unfortunately. And we, we have to fix that, obviously. It should be cheap. WHO wants it to be less than a buck per dose. It has to be genetically stable. We'll see where that comes in today. Storage considerations. Most vaccines today have to be frozen. It's tough, and WHO has developed this thing. This is a thermos. This is big. This is a big thing that we're talking about here. And they use this to deliver vaccines to places where there are no freezers, because there are a lot of those in the world. And finally, delivery is a factor. You know, we have very few orally delivered vaccines. That's easy. Polio vaccine is orally delivered. A needle is tough. People do not like needles. And we have some new technologies that are going to get around this. And I'm going to tell you about those today. Here's a diagram of every way I can think of to make a vaccine. And maybe someday there'll be some new ones. This is what we use now. You start with your virus. You identify a medical need. So if there are 10 cases a year of a particular virus infection, we're not going to make a vaccine for that. We need to have more. That's a medical need. You can do all of these things. You can make Replication-competent vaccines, they're infectious, but you have to make them not cause disease. That's cause attenuation. We'll talk about that. You can inactivate the virus with chemicals so it's no longer infectious and inject that. You can break it up into parts. This is what we do with the flu vaccine. We treat the virus with chemicals to break it into bits. Sometimes you purify some of the bits. Or you can do recombinant DNA-based methods. You can clone an antigen from a virus. You can produce the protein in various cells, bacteria, insect cells, or yeast. Uh, you can make a vector. We, you could clone the antigen into another virus and use that as a vaccine. You can use DNA vaccines. You can actually inject DNA into the arm muscle, get an immune response against the encoded protein in the DNA. Or you can express uh, individual proteins make subunit vaccines, or sometimes the proteins will assemble into virus-like particles, empty particles, which are then injected. And we'll cover most of these today. Here at the moment is a list of all the viral vaccines licensed in the U.S. This is, means that they have been gone through extensive clinical testing. There are lots of vaccines that are still in testing that are not on this list because they're not licensed, like the Ebola vaccine, Zika vaccine, and many others. But you can see here, many viruses are covered. Different types of vaccine, both attenuated, inactivated, yeast-produced vaccines of the various sorts. Uh, and these are the indications for use. You know, most of these are for the general population, but there are specific cases. For example, military recruits only get adenovirus vaccine. The general population does not. Smallpox, 
lab workers in the military as well. And here's the shingles vaccine, varicella zoster. It's only old people, 60 years uh, and older. And then there's a schedule right here. But you can see lots of universal vaccines for infants. Measles, mumps, rubella is one of them. Polio vaccine. So we'll go through a couple of these and explain how they're made uh, and how they work. Let's start with inactivated vaccines. Here we take an infectious virus and we simply treat it with a chemical formalin propiolactone detergents and it eliminates infectivity, but it doesn't change the antigenicity. And you have to test this, of course, in animals first to make sure that these treatments don't change the antigenicity of the virus. And the first one we'll talk about is the inactivated polio vaccine. And this is, of course, against poliomyelitis which is, a, I believe we talked about this in acute infections. Uh, this is a word coming from Greek and Latin roots. A quote from a 1959 textbook of medicine, a common acute viral disease. You won't even find this in your textbook of medicine any longer because it, there are less than 100 cases a year, but it used to be a common disease in the US. And in most cases, it had a, you had a febrile illness uh, and then you know, as I said before, lower neuron paralysis only in 1% of the people. But that drove the development of vaccines. At its peak in the U.S., 20 to 30,000 paralytic cases a year in the U.S. Multiply that times 100 to, to see all the people who were infected. Hospitals were full of iron lungs because if you if the muscles that drive respiration were paralyzed, you couldn't breathe, and these iron lungs would breathe for you. Most people were able to get out of these, but there are still a few people in this country who, who are living in their iron lungs from the 30s and 40s. You can see them in museums nowadays, and I found one on eBay not too long ago. You can buy one on eBay for about $40,000, and um, I don't know what you would do with it, but if you want to have one, you can get one there. FDR, four-term president of the U.S., could not walk. He had polio in his 20s. But there weren't many pictures of him taken showing him like this one with leg braces and having help getting out of a car. So he drove the fundraising to make the current polio vaccines that we use now. He started the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. He started the March of Dimes. I don't know if any of you know this. You certainly don't remember it. He used to have kids mail dimes to the White House. Can you imagine today? They wouldn't allow it because they'd be afraid there was anthrax in the envelopes. He raised $500 million by this practice. He also would have people standing outside around the holidays, you know, March of Dimes. You would put a dime in. He raised a lot of money. He, had, he paid for the development of the two vaccines, and the one we're talking about today is an activated polio vaccine, which is treated with formalin. This was done by Jonas Salk. They ran a clinical trial in 1954, 1,800,000 children. She, the biggest clinical trial ever, and probably there will never be one bigger than that. It's funded by the National Foundation. It had about 50% protection, and it was licensed the day after it was announced. 50% is not what you would want in a vaccine. You want 80% or more. And just for reference, the best HIV vaccine that's been tested so far, gave 30% protection, which is about the placebo effect that you would expect. But anyway, this was licensed because parents wanted to protect their kids against polio. Look at the headlines in the New York newspapers. So it was a big deal. Unfortunately, within a month, there were a number of cases of paralysis in kids who had gotten the vaccine. It turned out that a company in California called Cutter Laboratories. They had made some of the batches of vaccine. They didn't follow the protocol properly. And so there was infectious virus in the vaccine. And of course, this is injected into the kids and they got paralyzed. This was a huge issue, of course. It was called the Cutter incident. Eventually it was fixed. But I think this is the origin of modern day objections to vaccines. Because here, parents trusted people making these vaccines. They brought their kids in lines to get immunized and somebody screwed up because they didn't follow the protocol. So that's our fault. The way this vaccine works 
It's injected intramuscularly. It gives rise to antibodies in the blood, essentially. When you ingest virus, it goes into your intestine. It replicates as it would normally, spreads to the blood, and there it encounters antibody, and the antibody blocks the infection, so you don't get paralysis. However, you can still excrete virus, so you can still transmit virus. So unless everyone is immunized, this will not stop an outbreak. The vaccine was introduced in 1955, the inactivated vaccine, and it brought polio from 20 to 30,000 cases a year down to about 2,000 cases a year uh, in, the, in the 60s. The other inactivated vaccine I want to talk about is influenza virus vaccine. Remember, these are envelope viruses with segmented genomes. There are three types. We immunize against types A and B only. The C seems to cause mostly inapparent infections. And I've told you before, there are anywhere from 3,000 to 50,000 deaths per year in the U.S. caused by influenza. That's why we immunize against this virus. The vaccine is either grown in embryonated chicken eggs, it's then formalin inactivated, or it can be grown in cell culture as well. We manufacture a lot every year in the U.S. It's only 60% effective in people less than 65 years of age. Over 65, it's way less than 60%. And we're working on this because we need a better vaccine. The antibodies that are induced are against the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, and that's what we believe protects against infection. Now, up until recently, it was thought that if you had egg allergies, you should not get the egg-grown flu vaccine. But that turns out not to be true. A number of studies have been done showing that people with egg allergies are fine getting the flu vaccine. But nevertheless, there is a cell culture-grown vaccine. Because the virus changes frequently, we have to make new strains every year. Plus, the memory against this vaccine is poor, so we want to re-immunize. And what we do is we pick every year a strain or multiple strains that we think are going to predominate in the next flu season. We make reassortance of those viruses with viruses that are known to grow well in eggs because not every virus will grow well in eggs. Uh, and here, for example, is the 2017-18 vaccine. It's got an, a type A H1N1, an A H3N2, and a type B virus. This H3N2 is the predominant virus this year. Turns out that growing it in eggs destroys some of the antigenicity that's needed to protect against circulating strains. This in part explains why the vaccine was not so protective for the last few years. Making a flu vaccine is not easy. You have to start in January. This is for the Northern Hemisphere because our seasons, our flu seasons are opposite when it's winter. Up here, it's summer below. And then we have our flu season in the winter and then our summer is their winter, and that's when they have the flu season. So here's for the Northern Hemisphere. There is a global surveillance done by the WHO Global Influenza Surveillance Network. And they look all year round at what's circulating in the Northern and Southern Hemispheres, lots of lab isolations of viruses, and they make a guess at what's going to be the next prevailing virus. In January, they have to select the strains. They prepare reassortants, they grow them in eggs. You have to standardize the antigen, make sure it's potent, do some licensing, formulate it, package it all up, and that brings you to August, which is basically when we start immunizing. We start saying to older people, go get your flu vaccine in August, and the, and the season begins, of course, October, November, and lasts until just about now. Unfortunately, older people don't have good memory, and they're immunity is already gone. If they've got the vaccine in August, it's already gone by the spring. So this is why it's difficult to make the vaccine. And we, we're searching for new ways that don't involve a new strain selection uh, every year. The virus, of course, the changes that undergo from year to year in the hemagglutinin mainly. Here's a picture of the hemagglutinin, one of those spikes on the virus surface. And these colored areas these are epitopes. These are sites recognized by neutralizing antibodies. And these are documented sites where amino acid changes can lead to escape from antibody. You only need one amino acid change in any of these sites. Now the antibodies that you make 
will not react very well with the virus and it will escape antibody neutralization. The ones on the top are highly variable. The ones down on the sides on the stalk are more conserved and we're trying to make vaccines that target these sites because they vary far less than do the ones at the very tip of the HA. And a lot of labs are now working on trying to come up with a better influenza vaccine so we don't have to immunize people every year. Most of you have none is incorrect, which is right. None of these are wrong. They're all right. You can use chemicals to inactivate infectivity, uh, flu vaccine, polio vaccine. They do, they do not replicate is correct. They're inactivated. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete, cut or incident. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. All of these are right. Subunit vaccines. Here we take either the virus particle and break it up and sometimes we purify the right pieces or we express individual genes in a vector and we can express this in bacteria, yeast, insect cells, purify the protein. Sometimes the protein will self-assemble into a virus-like particle. Remember way back when we talked about the information for virus assembly is built into the sequence of the capsid protein. So here's a good example. You just make a single capsid protein and often it will make a particle. Here is flu block, which is a, f a new flu vaccine where you take the gene for the hemagglutinin and you put it in an insect virus. It's called baculovirus. And then you use that to infect insect cells to produce the protein. And the protein expression leads to the production of particles, which you can see here by EM. So you take your baculovirus, you infect insect cells, and you do this in huge fermenters, you know, hundreds of liters here. Uh, and then you purify the protein. It's relatively quick. You can do this within two months. So this is just HA alone. It's got some advantages. You know, you can make a lot of protein in these insect cells. You don't need serum because the insect cells don't need serum, which is a big part of the cost of others. Unfortunately, the efficacy of this is no better than the traditional flu vaccine. It's just a little bit easier to make. And this is approved for people between 18 and 49 years old because that's the people that's been tested in. You can only use a vaccine in the age group in which you test it. If you want to use it in five-year-olds, you have to do a clinical trial in five-year-olds. So that's one technology. Here is another. Uh, this is the hepatitis B virus vaccine. Remember, Hep B is a big problem globally, causing liver cancer in many millions of people. The particle you remember is an icosahedral particle with a membrane around it. The membrane is full of hepatitis B antigens. You can take the gene encoding the hepatitis B surface antigen and produce it in yeast. It will assemble into these empty particles. So there's no DNA. It's a non-infectious vaccine, but you can inject this into people and it will provide immunity. It's a nice example of a virus particle vaccine. Human papillomavirus, as I've told you before, warts are caused by viruses. There are lots of different kinds of warts and you can have them all over your body. Some are sexually transmitted. In fact, this is the most common sexually transmitted disease in the US, uh, papillomavirus. Some of these cause low risk genital warts, but others are at high risk for cancers. And these can be cancers, cervical, vaginal, penile, anal, oropharynx cancers. We get about 31,000 cases of these a year just in the US, again, transmissible papillomaviruses that cause cancers in these areas. And they're mostly types 16 and 18. Half of Americans are infected with genital HPV. And this is a study done between 18 and 20, 59 years of age. This is a graph actually published last year in the New York Times. These are infection positivity of uh, different men and women populations. You can see ranging from 23 to 24% uh, up to 63 to 65%. These are, again, these high-risk, genitally transmitted HPVs, high risk for causing cancer. So because of this, we developed uh, HPV vaccines. These are cancer vaccines. They prevent cancer. We don't care about the other warts that don't give rise to cancer. We want to vaccinate against these because they lead to cancer. And there are three different vaccines. Gardasil, made by Merck, 
is types 6, 11, 16, and 18 produced in yeast. They recently expanded this to have nine different serotypes. You know, again, 16 and 18 are the most common, but you want to catch all of them if you can. GlaxoSmithKline makes Cervarix, which is 16 and 18 made in insect cells. And this is the way they work. The virus is made of a couple of proteins, a major capsid called L1. You take the gene encoding it, you express it in yeast or in insect cells. The protein assembles into virus-like particles, which you can purify readily, and you immunize people, and they give rise to mucosal uh, antibodies, which will prevent infection. This is the cervical mucosa here, but it can be different parts of the genital tract as well. And this prevents infection. It's very effective at preventing uh, infection. Of course, it has to be given before becoming sexually active, although it can also be used later on. It will also help in other age groups. It's been studied in both men and women. So this is a cancer vaccine. Some of the future vaccines that we can anticipate, a lot of work going on with influenza virus. Here is one where you make virus-like particles in plants. If you just make HA alone, it makes a particle. It forces budding out of the cell membrane and makes a particle. This has been done in many different kinds of systems, but it's been done in plants. And here's a picture of a particle that you get in plants. Remember, it's just HA. There's no RNA in this, no other viral protein. So the HA alone drives budding of the particle. And you can make this very easily in plants. You can take the HA gene and introduce it into plants. You can either do transient transfection, or you can make a transgenic plant. You grow up your plant. It's done often with Nicotiana benthamiana, which is a genetically manipulable plant. And then the virus particles will grow in the fluid. You then harvest the leaves. You basically crush them to recover the fluid and purify the polypeptide. One square meter makes 20,000 doses very cheaply. And these are in clinical trials as well. Again, though, they're not better than the existing vaccine in terms of efficacy. They're easy to make. You could make them more quickly maybe than the egg-grown vaccine, but we still need to do better. Subunit vaccines, the ones I've just talked about, HBV, HPV, they're a common DNA. You can make them very quickly. There are no viral genomes present, so they're not infectious. You don't have any issues relating to that. The problem is they, they tend to be expensive because they're new technology and you have to recover your development costs. They typically have to be injected, and they're not really very antigenic because they don't replicate. Remember, the best antigens induce inflammation, right? Rubor, dolor, calor, tumor. And if a virus doesn't replicate, it's not going to kill cells. So dendritic cells and macrophages are not going to pick up parts of viruses from dead and dying cells. There's not going to be much inflammation, so you're not going to get a great adaptive response. And therefore, for these subunit vaccines that don't replicate, what we do is we add adjuvants to them so that it stimulates inflammation and you get a better immune response. So the adjuvants mimic the inflammatory effects of infection. And here are some adjuvants that have been used at the bottom. These are three licensed adjuvants. One is aluminum hydroxide or aluminum phosphate. That's in the HBV vaccine. Again, the HBV is not replicating. So if you don't add an adjuvant to stimulate inflammation, you don't get good immune responses. Another one very interesting is ASO4. Uh, this is in one of the HPV vaccines. This is a TLR4 ligand, toll-like receptor 4. This binds TLR4, which then induces the synthesis of cytokines, and that kick-starts inflammation. So it's really an interesting adjuvant that takes the place of the virus replicating. That's uh, ASO4 over here. And another one, MF59, is an oil and water emulsion down here. This st also stimulates innate receptors. A lot of these adjuvants also help to concentrate the antigen at the site of injection and keep it there longer so it doesn't diffuse away, and that seems to give a better immune response. So we use these adjuvants in some vaccines. Now, the downside with an adjuvant is that your injection is going to hurt. Why is it going to hurt more than a vaccine without an adjuvant? Can you guess? Because you have inflammation. You have swelling, redness, all of that, and it hurts more. So people 
don't tend to like it as much as vaccines without, but it's better for you. In fact, if your injection, if your vaccine injection hurts, it's good. It means you're having a good immune response. I was just at Emory last week and I talked to a group who is developing these micro needle patches for vaccination. What these are, are small synthetic patches which have these spikes, micro needles that when band-aided onto your skin, they just go into the outer layers of the skin, into the, the live layers of your skin, and they're coated with antigen, and they're very effective at inducing uh, immune responses. And in fact, this is a paper on a phase one trial which was done, safety, immunogenicity, and acceptability of the microneedle patch. They compared it to injected, and people preferred this to the injected. Surprise, right? which you would think. What you do is you put this microneedle patch on a Band-Aid, then you put it on your skin. And they tried putting it there on, near the wrist or the traditional place on the arm. The arm worked better because you have more lymph nodes under your arm than you don't have any lymph nodes down here. So I, I don't know why they even tried that. But traditionally, we always inject viruses uh, and vaccines into your arm. So they put this there. And then... Panel D here is when you're done. You know, you leave it on for a week or so. The needles dissolve. So they can't be reused, right? That's just part of the problem with needles is that people reuse them for drug use and you get contamination. These can't be reused because they melt away. So they're waiting to do a phase two. And they told me well, we need money to do a phase two. So we got to get a company interested in this. And so they're working on that. But you're going to see these replace needles in the next 10 or 15 years, mark my word. And on the right is thermostabilization. I told you you have to keep vaccines cold in those thermoses. What if you could make a vaccine that didn't need to be kept cold? We can do it. One of the ways you can do it is by adding sugars. You can dry the virus in sugars. The sugars coat the particles and stabilizes them against high temperatures. So here is a study we're looking at weeks of incubation at 25 and 60 degrees centigrade. 60 degrees is warm, right? And look at this. This is percentage activity remaining. This is, I think, HA activity of the flu vaccine. And no, no loss of activity after 16 weeks at 60 degrees. So this means you wouldn't have to refrigerate these vaccines. I think this is going to be applied to most vaccines in the future as well. So pretty exciting stuff. Now, what about flu having to change it every year? People are working on this as well. Remember I told you that the head region epitopes are the most variable on the HA. The stem region epitopes are more conserved. So people are trying to figure out how to direct the immune response to the stem of the HA. Right now, when you get immunized with influenza, most of the antibodies are made against the head region epitopes, the ones on the stem are immunosubdominant. You don't get many antibodies against them. You have to look very hard. People do make them, but they are rare. So here is an approach which was just published last year. And what you do is you make chimeric viruses where the HA has the stem of the virus you're interested in engendering immunity to. In this case, it's a, say an H1 stem. And then you put different heads on the HA molecule. So you're making a virus vaccine with chimeric HAs. The idea here is you would immunize initially with this red-green combo, and then you boost with a blue-green combo. The memory on this boost is gonna be mainly against the stem. If you simply boosted with the red-green, the memory would be mostly against the red HA head. But if you swap the head out so it's brand new, you're not going to get a memory response. You're going to get a primary response against the head, and you get a memory response against the stem epitopes. And then you do a third immunization with yet a different combination, this one pink, green, and you get more boosted antibodies against the stem. So this has been shown to work in that now if you use this approach, you can make the stem immunodominant, and you get more antibodies against it. It's been shown to work in animals. Now, of course, we have to do clinical trials. But this is one of several approaches that are being developed to try and direct the antibodies against the stem. Again, the reason being 
the stem changes far less frequently than does the head. And it may be only necessary to immunize once every 10 or 15 or 20 years, and that would be great. But again, flu is not a problem to test vaccines because every year we have flu seasons. So these vaccines can all be tested in people. Our next question is, what are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, long lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. 100% all of the above. Let's talk about attenuated vaccines. These are infectious vaccines that have been modified so they don't cause disease. You get replication, you get an immune response, but no disease. So you have to take the virus, the, the one that causes disease that's virulent and somehow make it not virulent. We can compare the immune response to an inactivated virus vaccine where you typically have to give multiple doses to achieve a good level of antibody. An infectious vaccine, you give one dose and of course it replicates in you, so it's self-amplifying. Here is a general scheme for the old way of making these vaccines. You would take a human virus, you can grow it up in human cells, and then you grow it in some other animal cell with the idea is if you can adapt the virus to grow better in a cell of a different species, maybe it won't cause disease in humans. And this picture is showing the virus slowly turning green after passage in monkey cells. And then in human cells, it doesn't grow well. It still has to grow in you. It has to replicate in you. Otherwise, it won't be immunogenic, but it, it doesn't cause disease. We can now do better than this, and we are starting to improve this, but the infectious vaccines that we have were based on these kinds of strategies. So flu mist is one of them. This is a virus that's injected into your nose with a syringe lacking the needle, of course, and uh, it replicates in your upper respiratory tract. It does not make you sick, and it gives you pretty good immunity. The way this, these were made, these were viruses that were selected to be cold adapted and temperature sensitive, which means they are better replicating in the upper tract, which where the temperature is lower than in the lungs, which is a higher temperature. And they were found to be attenuated in ferrets. They were tested in humans. And every year, there's a master strain now that we have. And every year, we reassort it with the currently circulating HANNA to make a new vaccine. And this is produced by only one company in the US, Metamune. So they don't make a lot of doses, so often you can't get this. They run out very early on. This is still not as good in terms of efficacy as where we need to be. It's a little better than the inactivated vaccine, but not everyone can get it, so it's kind of a moot point. We have a poliovirus vaccine that is infectious and attenuated. It's called the Sabin oral vaccine, which was introduced after the inactivated vaccine. This was introduced in 1962 and led to the elimination of polio in many countries. The way this works is you ingest the vaccine. You drink it on a, or you chew it on a sugar cube. The virus goes into your intestinal tract. It replicates in the mucosum. It gives you intestinal immunity. It then gets into the bloodstream. It gives you blood immunity as well. And therefore, if you are then challenged later on, or if you ingest wild type polio, the virus will not replicate in your intestinal tract because you have protection. So that's how that works in contrast to IPV, which cannot prevent intestinal replication and shedding. There are three serotypes of polio vaccine. They all cause paralytic disease. So the vaccine includes all three serotypes. And what Albert Sabin did is he simply empirically passaged the three serotypes in different hosts, and at each passage, he would take some virus and test it to see if it was unable to paralyze a monkey. And in the end, you can see animals and cell passages, plaque purifications. He got three serotypes which do not cause paralysis, and these were licensed in 1961. In 1980s, we were able to sequence these viruses and determine the mutations that he had selected for. And you can see they're listed here for the three serotypes. They all have a mutation in the five prime non-coding region, which we've talked about before, attenuates virulence, and then a few other capsid mutations. Today, these vaccines would not be licensed by the FDA. You would be required to provide the sequence. And having so few mutations is a recipe for reversion. 
And in fact, that's what happens with these viruses. But at the time when they were made, we didn't know that. Here are the three mutations in the context of the viral genome. The genome is a 7,500 base plus strand RNA. It has a five prime non-coding region, which is highly structured. And these three mutations in the three serotypes of the vaccine, type 1, 2, and 3, are all clustered within stem loop 5. They appear to interfere with internal ribosome entry. And that's how they attenuate replication. In the 1980s, a British coronavirologist had a, had a child, and the child received the polio vaccine. And so he asked, what were the changes in the polio vaccine sequence from day to day after immunization? So every day he would take his baby's diaper to the lab, and they would remove virus and sequence it. And that's what was published in this Nature paper in 1985. He calls this the nappy experiment. So here we have Sabin vaccine. This is the type 3 version, which he looked at. It has a U at 472, which makes it safe. If you inject it into the brain of monkeys, it gives a low lesion score. And this is his son, David Miner. 24 hours, he's excreting virus with a U31. But at 35 hours, not even two days, starting to revert to a C during replication in the gut. At 47 hours, it's all C. David was fine. In fact, most people who get polio vaccine do the same thing with all three serotypes, and they don't get polio. But if you take these viruses and inject them into a monkey in the brain or spinal cord, they will cause paralysis, very high lesion score. So this vaccine reverts during replication in the gut. And in fact, that's a problem because in about one in one and a half million recipients of this vaccine, they develop paralysis. And that is shown on this graph, which is the cases of polio in the US from 61 to 2003. Total cases of polio in the line, you can see now by the 60s were, were quite low. But the bars are the vaccine-associated cases, that, the cases of paralytic disease caused by the vaccine. And you can see after 1979, all the cases of polio in the US were caused by the vaccine, about 8 to 10 every year. And this is, an, this is an unfortunate occurrence. And in hindsight, we probably should not have used this vaccine. We had some hint that this was happening very early on. But it was decided not to switch the vaccine. In 2000, we switched to IPV because of this, and there's no longer any vaccine-associated polio in the US. But this vaccine is being used in most countries in the global eradication effort. WHO declared in 88 they would eradicate polio uh, and stop immunization. We are almost there, we're behind the timeline. We're almost there, but the problem is we're using this OPV, which is reverting. And now many of the cases of polio left are caused by the vaccine itself. Which raises the question, can you eradicate any virus? And of course we have eradicated smallpox and these are the two features that you need in order to eradicate a viral infection. You have to only be in one host. If you replicate in animals other than humans, you cannot eradicate it. And you have to have lifelong immunity after vaccination. In both smallpox and polio, these two are, are present. So after the eradication of smallpox, the WHO decided to go after polio. They're next going to go after measles as well. So they started the eradication effort in 88. 125 polio endemic countries, about 450,000 global cases of polio. By 10 years later, we had 40 polio endemic countries. Another 10 years, five polio endemic countries only. And this is the latest graph, which I just downloaded from polioeradication.org. Last year, 2017, there were 22 cases of wild polio and 96 of vaccine-derived polio. Most of those were in Syria, and the problem is that in Syria they stopped vaccinating because of the conflict. And these vaccine-derived viruses, when you take the oral polio vaccine, you excrete them and they get into the sewage and they spread. And they can cause outbreaks if immunization coverage drops. And all the wild-type polio viruses are limited now to Pakistan and Afghanistan. And those are the two endemic countries. We've eradicated type 2. There's been no type 3 since 2012. So these are all, the blue ones are type 1. The, the vaccine associated are actually type 2. So we have stopped immunizing against 
type 2 with the OPV in order to get around that. But at some point, we're going to have to um, switch entirely from OPV to IPV. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have these vaccine-associated cases. The other day, we discussed this paper in the master's student part of this course, which emphasizes that even if you eradicate any virus, if you have the sequence, you can build it. So we've eradicated smallpox, but the sequence is in the database. And this paper shows how you can construct horsepox virus from chemically synthesized fragments. So it could be done basically with any virus. So you have to be very careful. I want to end up by talking about engineering attenuated vaccines. We no longer passage virus from one host to another to try and empirically attenuate it. We try and use genetic engineering to direct changes to the genome. And here's a story where we start with the yellow fever vaccine. And this was developed in 1938, right here at Rockefeller University by 176 passage of, of the yellow fever in chick embryo tissues. This was done by Max Tyler. And this vaccine was licensed afterwards. So far, a half a, a billion doses have been used. If you go to a yellow fever endemic part of the world, you get this vaccine. So here is the yellow fever particle. It's a typical Flavy virus. And this vaccine was used as a backbone to make a dengue virus vaccine. We talked about dengue virus some time ago as being a big problem in much of the world, mosquito transmitted Flavy virus. So what was done was to clone a DNA copy of the yellow fever vaccine and simply substitute the E and the PRM proteins from dengue virus. So the E, remember, is the envelope dimer and the PRM, the blue protein there. And these are the proteins against which neutralizing antibodies are produced. So we have all yellow fever except the glycoprotein. This was uh, given clinical trials extensively and licensed just last year in a few countries. And this is called Dengvaxia. It's a tetravalent vaccine. There are four serotypes of dengue. And these are all built into the yellow fever backbone. It's been licensed in three countries. Unfortunately, protection against dengue 2 is poor, and it led to enhanced disease. Similar to that when you get a second infection with dengue, remember? This vaccine in people who had not been infected before had enhanced disease. So it's no longer licensed in people less than nine years old, which is unfortunate because they're a main target for this. In order to get this, you have to have been previously infected with dengue. That's a nightmare to figure that out. You have to do a serological test on everyone before giving this vaccine. So this is problematic. But Sanofi spent billions of dollars developing it, and they're kind of reluctant to withdraw it from the market. So that remains. In the, in the meantime, the NIH has been developing its own vaccine, which is called TV003. This is produced by mutagenesis of a dengue virus infectious clone. So we're not starting with yellow fever virus. They made a 30 nucleotide deletion in the three prime non-translated region of dengue virus. And this attenuates the virus. It reduces its virulence, but doesn't block it from replicating. It's highly immunogenic. It's been tested in humans and it's very effective. And that is gonna go into clinical trial and that'll probably replace Denvaxia because it's all dengue. Now, when new viruses emerge, we can respond by making vaccines really quickly. Zika virus emerged in Brazil in 2015. Many, many cases, and of course, brought to our attention by an increase in microcephaly. This virus had been around since 1947, it slowly spread eastwards, but very few cases until 2007. There were outbreaks in the Pacific Islands and then spread to Brazil. So we knew about this virus, but suddenly it came into a immunologically naive population, caused lots of cases, and so now we're developing vaccines. This is a, a disease very much like dengue or chikungunya, where you have joint pain and fever, uh, very few fatalities, very typical conjunctivitis and rash on the hands and the, and the body. But we realized that uh, the virus can get into the central nervous system can cause a variety of issues in adults, but in babies, this was the problem. If you're infected in utero during development, you can develop microcephaly, a small head, which is a consequence of a smaller brain, lysencephaly, which is smooth brain, macular atrophy, and water on the brain as well. So the virus, Zika virus, is getting across the placenta in pregnant mothers, infecting the baby and causing these defects. 
And so for this reason, many companies have started to make Zika vaccines. So this is basically every vaccine approach that I showed you on the first slide. And about 20 companies are doing this. Everything is being tried from inactivated to attenuated to recombinant vaccines. Let me show you a couple of them. A DNA vaccine has been tested. You take the gene encoding the glycoprotein, you put it in a plasmid, you purify the plasmid and you simply inject it intramuscularly. The plasmid's taken up by APCs presented in the lymph nodes to T and B cells and you get a remarkably good immunization. Here's an experiment in mice. So this is viremia in mice. These are days after infection. These sham mice have been immunized with just a vector. And these mice have been immunized with DNA encoding the PRM and envelope. And you can see no viremia. So this is a good vaccine in mice. And of course, the next step is to put it in people. Uh, another approach is to take vesicular stomatitis virus, which does not make people sick, remove the glycoprotein coding region, the G glycoprotein of VSV, and replace it with the E glycoprotein of Zika virus. And this has also been tested in not only mice, but non-human primates and shown to be protective. So this will go into people as well. And finally, we have a live attenuated vaccine. And this involves deleting 30 nucleotides from the three prime non-coding region of Zika virus, exactly the same thing as was done with dengue virus that I told you about just a few slides ago. They, they built on that finding. Again, you delete these 30 nucleotides, the virus can still replicate, but it doesn't cause disease. And so this has been shown to uh, produce sterilizing immunity in mouse models. So we have a whole bunch of Zika vaccine candidates now ready to go into people, but there's, no, there's not much Zika infection anymore, so they're going to be very difficult to test. But presumably the next outbreak will be able to uh, use some of these. And in case you're wondering who would get these vaccines, there is no circulation of Zika in the U.S., minimal, I should say. There was small outbreak in Florida, small outbreak in Texas. Of course, it's vectored by Aedes aegypti, but the rest of the country does not spread. There are plenty of imported cases. So we're not going to immunize the U.S. against Zika. However, if you go to a country that has Zika, especially if you're pregnant or you want to get pregnant, then you should probably get this vaccine. It'll be a travel vaccine, pretty much like yellow fever vaccine. So that is a way to prevent infection by immunizing you. For many viruses, we don't have vaccines, but we can use another approach to deal with those infections, and that's antivirals, and we'll talk about that next time. <laughs>